drive. Oh, Nancy, thank you so much. We appreciate your donations. However, we do need non-perishable foods. Well, I would have my husband bring something over, but he's afraid to come. Oh, we understand. And what we can do, solution number one, is one of us can come out to your car and take the food out from your trunk. Perfect. Any, or you can order through Amazon, Whole Foods, Walmart, and have those foods shipped to Holy Spirit Lutheran Church campus. So should I just call the church office to have them come out to the car if it's during the week? Definitely. Perfect. That's what we'll do. Excellent. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you to all of you who have already donated for our Thanksgiving food drive this year. We have 1,100 pounds, but we need 3,500 pounds. Come bring your non-perishable goods to us to add to our goal. So thank you very much, Nancy and Kara, for that uh, amazing presentation of the, the food drive. Again, folks, please remember, it's not about reaching a goal of 3,500 pounds. It's about the hundreds of people that we are going to be able to feed uh, on Thanksgiving week. So that's our push. That's our effort. That's our passion. We want to feed hungry people. Well, let me tell you what else is going on here at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. Tomorrow, tomorrow evening, that's Monday the 16th, we are going to have pizza with the pastors, and that is open to everyone in the congregation. So we invite you to come and join us here tomorrow evening, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., right outside on the patio. We'll make sure that it's a safe environment for you. All you need to do if you want to join us is contact the office and pre-register for pizza with the pastors. Um, the next thing I want to tell you about is the following week, November 23rd. We're going to have a very special night for everyone who has volunteered here at the church in one of our ministries. And we know that there are many of you. And we want to celebrate with you by providing you with dinner. And we're going to have pizza and we are going to have pie. And so if you would like to be here for pizza and pie on November 23rd uh, from 5 o'clock until 6.30 p.m. and be part of our celebrating and thanking volunteers, Please pre-register with the office so that we make sure that we have plenty of food for everyone. And again, our commitment to you is that we're going to make it a safe environment for all of us. Then a number of you have been wondering, are we going to have our Thanksgiving Eve worship service on Wednesday the 25th? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We have so much to be grateful for. So on that Wednesday evening, November 25th at 7 p.m., we'll worship together, praise and honor and thank God for his goodness and mercy to us. And then immediately afterwards, we will have our pie fellowship outside on the patio. Now here, it's important to remember, since it's an indoor worship service, we are once again limiting it to 45 people. So if you want to be here for Thanksgiving Eve, please pre-register that you're going to be joining us. And of course, you're going to come for pie afterwards. Uh, please remember, bring a pie. The pie that we enjoy together is the pie that you bring. And I understand from Pastor Jim that his favorite is to have an apple pie. He would love to have that. Or a pumpkin pie. Is that right? All right, Pastor Jim says that's right. Pumpkin pie or apple pie. And of course, everything tastes better with whipped cream on it. So bring some whipped cream too if you can. Remember, slice the pie beforehand. We'll be waiting forever until we're able to eat a slice of pie. So br uh, bring your pie already sliced beforehand. I need you to tell you about this. December 13th, Sunday, December 13th, we are going to be having our annual meeting here at the church. So if you please put that on your calendar, December 13th, that's when we make important decisions about our future officers for 2021. And we also approve the operating budget for 2021 as well. So of course we saved the best announcement for this morning for the last, because I am very excited to be able to welcome this morning, Pastor Jim Grazer. And as all of you know, we have been in this process of finding our next lead pastor for the past three years, and God has now blessed us with an answer to our prayers and efforts by sending Pastor Jim Grazer to be with us. And this week has been his first week at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, and today will be his first Sunday uh, joining us for worship at Holy Spirit. So I am very grateful 
very thankful to announce that Pastor Jim Grazer is now here at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church as the lead pastor. Pastor Jim, we want to welcome you. Thank you. So good to have you here with us. Thank you. It has been a pleasure and an answer to our prayers uh, that Nicole and I can be among you. And just thank you for the great welcome that you all have extended to us. And we look forward to serving alongside of you. So to extend our welcome to you, I've asked Kara to come and then on behalf of the congregation, present some gifts to you. Here are your Holy Spirit Lutheran t-shirts, one for you. And Thank one you. for Nicole. We are so happy you are here joining our Holy Spirit Lutheran Church family. We will wear those proudly. And drink out of your Holy Spirit Lutheran Church mug. All right. <laughs> if you have all that. So, and then if everyone would join us after services to cut into this delicious cake to welcome Pastor Jim and Nicole to our Holy Spirit Lutheran Church family. We'll be on the patio with coffee. Please join us. Thank you very much, Kara. And I hope that uh, in the course of the weeks to come that you'll find uh, an opportunity to come here to our campus during the week or on Sunday mornings to worship with us where you'll be able to meet Pastor Jim in person. Please join with me in the brief order of confession and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. This weekend was all about caring for the beautiful oak trees on our Holy Spirit Lutheran Church campus. Volunteers worked very hard from the bucket lift and on the ground to eliminate the invasive vines and trim back the overgrowth. 
what a huge ask. So we want to say thank you for your time, willingness, effort, and strength. We appreciate you. So we had an amazing weekend of volunteers working together uh, to take care of our beautiful campus, especially, specifically, um, our beautiful trees. And you know, the reason why that works so well over these many years is because of the fact that we always have a great crew of volunteers to show up and help out. So I wanna say thank you. Thank you to those volunteers who put in the time and the effort to be able to clean up our trees and keep the campus looking nice. And then secondly, um, you hopefully saw in there was the expensive equipment that we have to rent. And because of your contributions, your generosity, we're able to rent the equipment that makes it possible. So to all the people of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, thank you for giving. Thank you for giving generously of time and financial resources so that we can take care of our beautiful campus. from John chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which, translates, <clears throat> which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. This ends the reading. Well, today is the first sermon I preach among you as your new pastor. You never get a second chance to make a good first impression, so the saying goes. 
Sometimes our zeal for making a good first impression can backfire on us. A young doctor was setting up his first office when his secretary told him there was a man to see him. The doctor wanted to make a good first impression by having the man think he was successful and very busy. He told his secretary to show the man in, and at that moment, the doctor picked up the telephone and pretended to be having a conversation with a patient. The man waited until the conversation was over. Then the doctor put the telephone down and asked, can I help you? To which the man replied, no, nope, I'm just here to connect your telephone. Oops. Rather than letting my ego drive any attempt to impress you, I thought that perhaps I'd let scripture guide me today. So I looked at how Jesus began. Jesus' first sermons, if you will. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel signify the beginning of Jesus' public ministry immediately after he's tempted in the wilderness. Matthew tells us, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Mark says, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I didn't find that too helpful. I didn't think the way to begin our relationship with each other was for me to implore you to repent as if I had assumed some things about you. Moving on to Luke's gospel, things get worse. Jesus preached his first sermon and Luke tells us all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Even though I'm pretty sure there's no cliffs in Juno Beach, I really didn't want you plotting my death after my first sermon. So I moved on to John's gospel. John's gospel has a different flow than the other three. It opens with that hymn about the word becoming flesh. It then introduces us to John the Baptist, who will in turn introduce us and a couple of John's disciples to Jesus. And we are told that those two disciples start to follow after Jesus. The very first thing Jesus says to them is, what do you want? Or the NRSV translation reads Jesus asking, what are you looking for? And I thought to myself, here is a good first sermon. Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, what are you looking for? What do you want? I believe your call committee chairman, Steve, told me they met nearly 80 times before recommending me to your council. A host of other candidates either read over or interviewed over three years in the call process. What did you want? What were you looking for? Ta-da! Here I am. Apparently you decided I was what you were looking for. Not all of you, of course. Seldom do pastors have unanimous call votes. But the vast majority of you said, yes, I think this is what we are looking for. And the next thing Jesus says to those two disciples is, come and see. Jesus invites them on a journey with him. So here is my commitment I want to make to you. As your pastor, I am committing to accompany you on your spiritual journey. Let's walk together these next years. Let's see where our faith takes us. Let's see where the Holy Spirit leads us. Come and see. Let's discover together. I put it that way because I also want to confess something to you. I don't have all the answers. If what you were looking for is a pastor who has all the answers, you're going to be very disappointed with me. I have made over four mistakes so far this year. My commitment to you is not to be perfect. My commitment is to walk with you. Or this is the way Martin Luther put it. This life, therefore, is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. 
The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. All of us are on the way together. The late author and psychologist Ram Das put it this way, we're all just walking each other home. That's my commitment to you. Let's walk together a while. Together, let's come and see what Jesus is all about. More important than these first impressions you and I have of each other is the real question Jesus raises in John's gospel this morning. What do you want? What are you looking for? Sometimes, maybe more times than we would like, Jesus asks us a question instead of providing an answer to one. I hear so many people talk about finding life's answers in the scriptures, and I wonder if I'm the only guy with a different copy. Because more often than not, reading scripture and encountering God leaves me with more questions than answers. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. But at least today, this text before us comes right out and confronts us with a question. You may not recognize at first that it is directed at you and me, but I think it is. In the story, Jesus asks this question of Andrew and one other unnamed disciple. Let's say for our purposes, that other disciple is you or me. So there one of us is standing with Andrew. We've just started following Jesus and Jesus turns around and asks, what are you looking for? And that, my friends, is the question, I think. What are you looking for as a follower of Jesus? That's a fair question. And not that Jesus needs my approval, but I think it's a good one to ask his followers. Because as I look around, the answers people try to offer are often the wrong answers. So many people are looking for a Jesus that isn't real. And this searching has been going on since the opening days of Jesus' ministry. How often have the crowds begun to grow and grow following Jesus, and then he'd lay out a new teaching for them, upping the ante a bit, and then the crowds would thin out again. There's a scene in the sixth chapter of John where Jesus' popularity is growing. He is healed on the Sabbath. He's fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. We're told that the crowd is ready to take him and make him their king. Jesus sneaks away from them, spends the night walking on the water to get over to Capernaum, and the next morning, the crowd eventually catches up to him. They ask, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you're not looking for me not because you saw signs. You're looking for me because you ate your fill of the loaves. And then he begins a long discourse teaching them that he is the bread of life. And chapter six concludes with John writing, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. This scenario is not unique to John's gospel. All four Gospels speak of times when the crowd is reduced to a few faithful followers because Jesus clarifies his mission to them and begins to speak about crucifixion or about offering his life so that others may know life and about how he expects his followers to act similarly. At one point in that story from John I mentioned, the crowd of disciples says, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? So in today's reading, when Jesus turns around and asks Andrew and us, what are you looking for? He's asking an honest question of us. What are you and I looking for? So many Christians are like that crowd with the bread. We come to Jesus constantly seeking things, so long as he's granting us what we want, we'll be happy to follow. But what about those times when the answer to our prayer is no? What about those times when the healing doesn't come 
or the financial rescue doesn't happen, or the children don't go the way they were raised and stop coming to church as adults? What happens when Jesus isn't the magician that fixes things and makes the bad things disappear? Many Christians see Jesus as a life insurance policy. They think, if I'm a good Christian, everything should go well for me my whole life. Be very clear in this. Jesus doesn't guarantee a life without suffering if you follow him. In fact, he says just the opposite. If you belonged to the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you do not belong to the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. No, Jesus is not the risk-free, safe approach to life. Some Christians think following Jesus may elevate their status in the community. Appearing religious makes you a better political candidate or a better dentist. Appearances remain everything for some in our society. And finding a good church-going mate cuts through the hassle of dating. But it seems to me that Jesus told a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector praying and which one was more acceptable. And there are always those followers chasing after Jesus to just simply tell them what to believe. Make the Bible literal. Make my ethical decisions simple, black and white issues. Tell me what to believe, pastor, so I don't have to trouble myself thinking about how to minister to prisoners and seek justice on their behalf instead of writing them off as people no longer worthy of love. How to minister to poor people instead of justifying ignoring them because we assume they're lazy. How to welcome all people to the table of grace and mercy instead of deeming some unfit for the kingdom because clearly their sin is worse than mine. I think Jesus is right to ask his question of us today. What are you looking for? Why are you following? What do you want? And not that Andrew needs my approval either, but I like the way he answers Jesus' question with a question. They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? They asked Jesus to take them with him. Show us where you live, they say. If you happen to be one of those modern followers asking what that same question, we people of the information age have a wonderful tool to discover where Jesus lives. All you have to do is type into Google Maps, and here's what it pulls up. Jesus lives where the poor are. We will need people who will volunteer to sort and distribute food at the food bank because that's where you'll find Jesus. Jesus lives where children are because they're special people in the kingdom of God and they need teachers and people who will spend time with them. Jesus lives with those who have no one to love them. Jesus lives with sinners. Thank God. To find out about Jesus, there is really only one way to do it. You start following. You can only learn so much about surfing by reading books. Sooner or later, you have to do it. You have to go where the surf lives. You can only learn so much about music by reading. Sooner or later, you have to go where the rhythm lives. You'll learn very little about Jesus unless you go where Jesus lives unless you follow where he leads, even if it is to places you thought a man like Jesus wouldn't go. And by the very nature of how Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter to follow him, the implication seems to be that you can't follow Jesus by yourself. You're supposed to gather with others. Martin Luther used to say that it takes two to be Jesus. You need another person to forgive and to forgive you. You need another person to love and to love you. 
to go with Jesus, you'll need at least another follower with you. Let's go together, you and me. Jesus responds to the disciples' questions about where he's staying by saying, come and see. Seeing is an important theme in John's gospel because he's not talking about just taking notice or watching. He's talking about really seeing, the kind of seeing that leads to learning, the kind of looking that leads to knowing. It's as if Jesus is saying, well, you'll have no shot at all unless you come along and see for yourself. Experience following. Do following. Unlike other rabbis of his day, Jesus didn't want to just sit around the synagogues talking about the kingdom of God. He wanted to be out in it, seeing and looking. He invites his followers to come with him the whole way. As the journey goes on, it keeps getting tougher. There weren't just healings and feedings. There were parables, challenging assumptions. There were public arguments with Pharisees. There were teachings about crucifixion. There were solemn meals shared. There were arrests. There was a cross. Come and see, says Jesus. Come all the way to the cross. I want to go all the way with you there. But that's not all the way, is it? The cross isn't the end. There was still more to see. Where are you staying, Jesus? Asked the disciples. Jesus didn't stay at the cross. Jesus didn't stay at crucifixion. Jesus didn't stay at death. Come and see, says Jesus. Come and see resurrection. Come and see new life. Come see your life made new. Come and see growth. Come and see healing. Come and see becoming. Come and see what you shall be. Come and see the whole road. What are you looking for? What do you want? Come and see. Please join with me now as together we will confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together for our closing prayers. Gracious Father, as we listen to the news and just experience daily living, all of us are aware of all of the uncertainty that surrounds us. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to do. We don't know who to believe. It just seems like everything is up for grabs. All day long, we're trying to make decisions about what is the right thing to do? What is the right thing to say? And will I be judged and criticized for my ideas and thoughts, my attitudes and beliefs? It seems like the day when we knew what to do and how to act are long behind us and we're wondering, 
Will those days ever return? So to be in your presence and to be aware of your constant, never-changing love gives me great internal peace. It keeps me grounded to the one thing that I can place my hope and confidence in, and it, it keeps me moving forward. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship, to gather around music and words and people that are consistent and continue to proclaim a message of goodness and hope, a message of promise that does not change. So thank you, Father, for loving me, for loving my family, for loving my church and my community and my place of work, that nothing can shake that, that you have given me a solid foundation to stand upon when everything else around me just isn't. Father, we have gone through an election, and here we are uh, many days past it, and we still don't know what is the outcome, who is going to be our future president. And so, Lord, even that, which is such a, a basic of our society, is uncertain. And so, Lord, help us to be patient. Help us to trust the process. And once again, Lord, we turn to you and say, may the outcome be what you know is best for our nation. And may we obey and follow you. Lord, we are hearing all around us that the COVID pandemic is on the rise again, that it's on the increase, that more people are getting infected and more people are sick and the hospitals are filling up and the number of deaths are increasing. And it's just been going on and on and on. And that's overwhelming. And we fear for the, the lives and the health of our loved ones and for ourselves. And yet again, there is not a clear course for what we should do. But this we know, that if we turn to you and humble ourselves before you and say, Lord, help our nation to heal and help me to do the right things and help me to love my neighbor, that, Lord, that you will guide us as long as we listen and obey. So protect us, Lord. Give us wisdom. Help us to make the right choices that will lead us out of this pandemic. And then, Lord, today we are celebrating that Pastor Jim is among us, that his wife, Nicole, that they are both here, and that they are here to lead us, to join us in ministry. And we are so grateful, Lord, that that has now begun, that what has been a process in the making has come now to fruition, and it is all by your hand of grace. So we thank you, Lord, for the tremendous work of this congregation, especially the call committee and the council, that in the end resulted in Pastor Jim and his wife, Nicole, being here, and that we can now together go forward as your spirit guides us into ministry. For all these things, Lord, we pray, we trust in your love and mercy, and now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.